Welcome to another edition of Systems Neuroscience and Complexity, everyone. Um, a real pleasure today to have Casey Picola, uh, homegrown hero who uh, has escaped uh, the, the confines of Australia and is now gallivanting around Europe, making us feel bad with all the places she gets to go traveling on the weekends. Um, it, it's been actually really fun watching Casey uh, sort of developing throughout her career. I remember uh, when I was uh, at the Brain and Mind Center as a sort of senior PhD student and early postdoc, uh, Casey was sort of one of the bright young uh, sort of up and coming stars uh, in our institute. And then I remember going overseas for my postdoc and going to a human brain mapping conference and kind of randomly sitting uh, in a, a sort of an auditorium, a bunch of you know chairs and everyone sort of sits there on their laptops and sort of taps away. And I heard this familiar accent, I looked up and Casey was presenting this awesome work on linking the microstructure of the cortex, kind of like the stuff that now uh, was, was talking to us about a couple of weeks ago with these kind of systems level neuroimaging and uh, analyses that we can do of things like fMRI and diffusion imaging. And um, it's been awesome to watch, you know, she's gone from strength to strength and I'm really excited to sort of see what she's up to now that she's moving on to another postdoc. So thanks for joining us, Casey, and uh, take it away. Thanks. Okay, uh, so today uh, we're going to talk about the ideal cortical map. Okay, let me get started here. Okay, I just need my slides to move. There we go. Okay, I'm just going to organize a few things. Sorry, give me two seconds. Ah. Okay, cool. Okay, so. What makes a map useful? I think that Alfred Kozimski gave a pretty compelling argument on this point. So if we take an actual territory like Europe and place three cities from west to east, we have them in the order Paris, Dresden, Warsaw. If we were to build a map of this territory and place Paris between Dresden and Warsaw though, then we'd say that this map is wrong. Um, it would lead us astray. So say we're in Dresden and we wanna to go to Warsaw, then we'd start heading for Paris based on this map, but that's obviously problematic. And so Kozimski says that the source of this inaccuracy is the map has a different structure to the territory. So the structure relates to the ordering between the parts. And so he um, said that a map is not the territory it represents, but if a map is correct, it has a similar structure to the territory, which accounts for its usefulness. And another perspective on the usefulness of maps comes a little bit closer from, um, to home from Oscar Fott. So in 1903, at the beginning of an era of publications by himself and Cecile Fott and Corbinian Broadman on cortical areas, he set out four guiding purposes of cortical mapping. He believed that cortical maps should fulfill these purposes in order to benefit both fundamental and clinical neuroscience. So first, the map should allow quick and reliable uh, topographical orientation. Second, it should be comparable between species or at least facilitate cross-species comparisons. Uh, third, it should have meaningful anatomical subdivisions of the cortex that suggest functional differences. And finally, the map should promote recognition of possible abnormal design, which is really important for clinical cases. So on one hand, we have this general notion that a map should represent the structure of the territory. And on the other hand, we have more specific purposes of what a cortical map should do for neuroscience research. Um, how about an ideal cortical map though? So I came upon this phrase in the work of Von Economo, I think with a, a good degree of humility. He wrote that the ideal cortical map would look very different to his now famous parcellation scheme. He suggested that an ideal cortical map would involve the superimposition of many different cortical maps with all the changes shown at every single point. I think this notion is quite intriguing because it indicates a departure from unidimensional approaches, which struggle to account for the heterogeneity and dynamics of neuronal assemblies. And also this statement suggests a way forward using multiple superimposed cortical maps. The utility of such an approach though, really depends on determining a manageable number of maps. Um, more than one, but maybe hopefully less than a thousand. And we can think about that problem mathematically, of course, how best to reduce the dimensionality and then learn the intrinsic structure of the brain. 
I think there's obviously challenges um, still remaining there. So I think it's nice to have complementary perspective, maybe from philosophy and biology, such as um, the work of Filimonov, who was a Russian neuropathologist working in the 1940s. He stated that uh, work must be carried out in a direction not only of differentiation, but also of integration, which must be justified by a sufficient number of essential characteristics. He gives an example of an essential characteristic as the ontogeny of the brain. And he goes on to discuss the difference in the development of cytoarchitecture of the isocortex versus the allocortex. So allocortex is the hippocampus and piriform, and the isocortex is almost everything else of the cortex. And he also points out that sitting between the allo and isocortex are periallocortical regions like the presubiculum. And that has this mixed transitional developmental and um, cytoarchitectural pictures. So here we're looking at the hippocampus. This is of a neural plate, so it's early in fetal development. And you can see we start with the isocortex here, and then we have the hippocampus in here. So FD is our fascia dentia, so the dentate gyrus roughly starts here. You see in the isocortex is a clear lamina pattern, and this is early in fetal development, so you can already see the layering there. And then you transition through the periallocortex, where you can still see some layers. And then once you get to the allocortex, maybe you can pick out three layers per tool, so there's less differentiation. And it's quite important for him to find that this was evident early in development. So what we see later on in the brain, in that there's this differentiation of isocortex from allocortex, is related to their different and um, ontogeny, so it's related to their different development as well. And so this gives us an idea that we can capture developmental differences in the adult brain just by looking at the cytal architecture. And so then let's talk about gradients. Uh, we know that the cortex is patterned by many cytoarchitectural gradients. I think the most beautiful illustration of this is by Bailey and von Bonnen in their frontispiece of the isocortex of men. The primary colors here represent the prominence of specific cytoarchitectural features. So for example, yellow is the absence of granule cells, so these yellow ones. Um, blue is for areas lacking six layers. But sometimes these are distinct and sometimes they overlap. So that this green cingulate has, is lacking both of those features. And there's many more different types of um, cytotectonic features that we could explore though. Uh, so take, for example, these three photomicrographs also taken from Bailey and von Bonnen's work. So these are nissel stains for cell bodies in three different cortical areas. And there's noticeable differences in the size of neurons. You see some giant granule neurons here. Um, also in the differentiability of layers. So in this middle one, I could pick out six or more layers here. Um, whereas this one on the right, it'd be very hard to pick any layers out. And generally the density of neurons changes as well. So there's a lot of different satellite tectonic features that we could look at that maybe go beyond these um, very salient ones that Bailey and von Bonnen originally looked at. And this is one of the main reasons I came to Ulich and what I'm doing in my work with Katrin Amunz and Timur Dixit is looking at um, deeper characterization of the site of architecture using uh, histological sections. And so while we don't yet have this complete picture of the cytoarchitectural gradients, there certainly are very prominent cytoarchitectural gradients that are discussed extensively in the literature. Um, in particular, we've been interested in whether cytoarchitectural gradients represent variations at multiple scales. So where they can capture a low, um, low dimensional um, description of cortical organization. Meslam's work strongly suggests that we can do this. So he described cortical organization as a series of rings. So that outermost ring here reflects the primary sensory area, so V1, A1, et cetera. And then he um, had the connectivity or the synaptic distance, as well as geodesic distance in often cases, as you move in towards limbic areas. So he found that there was this concordant change in synaptic distance from primary sensory areas, as well as the degree of laminar differentiation. So there's also um, decreasing laminar differentiation as you move across these rings. And the function of these areas also seems to change from a uh, very concrete sensory related, related processing, it becomes more transmodal. So you move from primary sensory areas, unimodal, heteromodal, then paralimbic and limbic. Some people would say there's either um, abstract or amodal. So this concordance between uh, functional changes and the structural changes as well. And he um, 
concisely describe this just as four levels as well, which I'll refer to sometimes. So you have sensory areas known as conical cortex based on the saddle architecture, then unimodal areas, heteromodal areas, and paralimbic areas. And this was overall described as the sensory fugal axis. And over the past years with Boris Bernhardt at the Mika lab, we've been trying to, um, oh, sorry, I just saw that I've been spotlighted by the host. I got surprised. Um, so we've been trying to map these cytoarchitecture gradients and their relation to function because this was classic work based on cytoarchitecture and especially electrophysiology in primates. So we want to bring this into the human domain a little bit more. And because we're going on a bit of an adventure of cortical cartography, I thought that we could start with a map of our own. Um, so we find ourselves in this magical land of neuroscience research, and it's up to you where we go from here. So I'm gonna start a poll, actually. Let's see if that works, hopefully. And um, I'll describe a little bit about the places that we can go. So we could go to Gradient Castle and talk about hierarchies and how the principal gradients of cytoarchitecture and function differ. Uh, we could venture to the dunes of change where we address how sensory fugal gradient changes during adolescence. Uh, then there's the more dangerous manifold volcano. Uh, it's a very multimodal study uh, that attempts to draw links from cell type specific gene expression all the way up to intracranial EEG. Or we can take a more relaxing cruise down to the cortical confluence. Um, if you love the hippocampus like I do, then this one's for you. It's about the mesial temporal lobe, which harbors this really incredible cytoarchitectural gradient. And we developed a new surface model that links the hippocampus to the neighboring isocortex, so we could explore this. And then finally, we could go to uh, default mode cove. Uh, we found that the neuroanatomy of this kind of mystical uh, functional network was largely overlooked in the literature. So we've tried to identify how the cytoarchitecture architecture and wiring of the default mode relate to its putative functional role. And that's uh, the one that I'm just writing up at the moment. So if people would like to vote in the poll, we might get a chance to go through one or two um, of these talks, of these projects, um, depending on how much time we have. I actually can't see the results of the poll. If anyone wants to let me know what's getting votes. I think Default Mode Co has 47% and it's winning at the moment. Excellent. Okay. I think possibly everyone's had a chance to vote. We'll head to yes. Default Mode Co. And if we have um, time afterwards, we can always quickly run through another place. Okay. So let's start. This one we also refer to as the machine and the ghost. Oh, good, I saw that. Okay, so manifold volcano is next up if we if we want to do a second one. Thanks. <laughs> okay, so the default mode. My slides are a little bit stuck. Here we go. Okay, so I think it's been pretty interesting to see how the conceptualization of the default mode network has evolved over the past 20 years. It was first described as a task negative set of regions representing this like offline mode of the brain. But then this was subsequently challenged by evidence of enhanced connectivity of the default mode during tasks that draw on memory, such as context specific decision making and narrative comprehension and social cognition. So these tasks share a dependence on the integration of information from internal as well as external sources. And several contemporary theories postulate that balancing internal and external information is a core aspect of default mode function. Uh, so for example, this really nice review by Yuri Hassan's group shows the position of the default mode in integrating incoming extrinsic information with prior information from long-term memory. And this is thought to enable formation of rich context dependent models of a situation as it unfolds in time. So that's the task-based literature. In the resting state literature, we tend to find the default mode conceptualized as the apex of a processing hierarchy. So for example, in stepwise functional connectivity, when you seed from primary sensory areas, it progresses to default mode and then achieves a new stable state. And the principal axis of differentiation in resting state functional connectivity, which you see below, also is anchored at one end by sensory areas and on the other side by the default mode. So emphasizing the default mode as an extreme opposition to primary sensory areas. 
And more so, this was possibly my favorite aspect of Daniel's paper, is that the default mode peaks are equidistant from um, these primary sensory sulci in terms of the geodesic distance as well. So maximally distant in terms of the um, geometry of the cortical mantle as well. So we set out to test these hypotheses and also provide a richer neuroanatomical description of the default mode because we found that was really lacking in the literature and I'm still constantly surprised that there hasn't been more work on the cytoarchitecture architecture and connectivity of the default mode. So from this perspective of neuroanatomy and also really inspired by um, like McLennan style ideas of parallel distributed processing, we ask what is the default mode made of? So what's the cytoarchitectural machinery in this kind of ghostly um, network? And also what's the position of the default mode in the brain? So how is it connected? And we're hoping this gives us a better idea of what information is entering the default mode and what the default mode is doing with that information. So we start by looking at the composition of the default mode with respect to cortical type. So cortical types were originally defined by von Economer, uh, the groupings of cortical areas into um, based on their cytoarchitectural features. And this was recently reanalyzed by Garcia Cervezas et al. in a really nice paper last year. And here I have a schematic of these different types. So you see conica cortex, so that's the primary sensory areas. Then you laminate three to one and dysgranular and agranular. And these vary in a few different cytoarchitectural properties. So it could be the um, size and density of the fourth, um, the granular layer. Also the sublayering of five and layers five and six, uh, the, where the largest pyramidal neurons are, it shifts from upper layers to more lower layers. Um, and also the clarity of the border between layers one and layer two. And in general, we're ranking them here according to granularity, so according to this feature, but there's many cytoarchitectural features that actually vary. And these are defined based on the topology as well. So there's nowhere in the brain where you should be able to jump from conica cortex to um, a granular. Although there's, it's not a perfect alignment because this is still using von economy areas, but in general, there should be an ordering. So you should move through um, these types as well as you move across the cortex. And so this also really nicely aligns with Meslin's idea of the sensory fugal hierarchy. So you could almost put these six types exactly onto the six rings um, that Meslin described. So we have conica cortex on the outside, and then we're running inwards towards um, limbic, which is agranular. And I think this is really cool because it provides a cytoarchitectural proxy for proximity to the external world versus the internal milieu. So we found that the default mode harbors all six cortical types. So signifying this really marked cytoarchitectural heterogeneity that might be surprising given we think of this as a somewhat unified network. And then we also use chi-squared tests to show that the cortical types are not equally represented within the default mode. Um, we compared the proportions of cortical types in the default mode to 1,000 randomly rotated versions of the axis, so the classic spin test. So this preserves the size and the shape of the default mode. We find that the default mode overrepresents you laminate one. So this is a heteromodal type we would um, would suggest, and it underrepresents conica cortical, so the primary sensory area. I think it was just might be a slight mis um, uh, misalignment or overlap because we're using networks and atlases that are not defined in the same individual. So I would guess that if you were to define the default mode and cytoarchitecture in the same individual, you wouldn't actually find any conical cortex within the default mode. Uh, the cytoarchitectural variability is much more expansive than just cortical types though. So that's why we start to use big brain. So I'll take this moment to introduce you to big brain a little bit. Uh, it's a 3D reconstruction of a sliced and stained postmodern human brain. Uh, the brain was extracted and sliced coronally at 20 micron thickness and then stained for cell bodies with a Merca um, silver stain. So it stains the cell bodies. And then the slices were scanned and the volume was reconstructed. So whole volume is available online at 100 micron resolution, and there's also um, 25 blocks available at 40 micron resolution, and you can still um, work with the 2D slices at 20 micron resolution as well.
And a key bonus of this data set for especially in your images is a team behind Big Brain. Uh, this was a collaboration between Ulich and the MNI, uh, so my two academic homes actually, is that they've also provided a transformation of this to standard imaging spaces. So they've transformed this to MNI 152 space and they constructed peel and white matter surfaces. So it's good for neuro images used to work in both the volumetric world and the surface world. So we mapped the cytoarchitectural variability within a default mode by measuring intracortical variations in cell body staining from big brain. So we extract these profiles. So we take the, the peel and the white matter surface and we make equivolumetric surfaces between. So the equivolumetric surface constraint means that we modulate the, thick, the distance between the surfaces based on curvature because we know from the work of Bock and others, um, and also Reynard, that the thickness of lamina actually changes as you move um, in and out of sulky and gyri. So this helps control for that a little bit by um, having this equivolumetric surface construction. And then at each surface, we sample the staining intensity. So you have these little lines um, running within the cortex. And then we have so cell staining by cortical depth. And so you see a range of the different profiles that we retrieve from within the default mode. And our, um, as a little side note, um, the way that we're doing these transformations between, for example, we have the year networks for the default mode, and then we have Big Brain, which does have its own cortical surface, but it's not a standard space. So if you need to transform between these, you also need specialized surface transformations. And Lindsay Lewis at the MNI has been developing some really nice ones using multimodal surface matching. And we've incorporated these and a lot of other transformations into a toolbox called Big Brain Warp. So if you're interested in using this type of data, um, feel free to get in contact or use that toolbox for kind of more of the methodological details that I might skim over a little bit here. So we have these um, staining intensity profiles from across all of the default mode. And then we correlate all these staining intensity profiles. So we have a matrix of cytoarchitectural similarity. And then we use diffusion map embedding, which is a bit of a, a favored technique of dimensionality reduction because it's um, nonlinear, but also produces relatively similar results to a, a PCA in general, when we're just looking at this first eigenvector, which is what I'll show here. So we've performed this dimensionality reduction. The first eigenvector is now um, projected back onto the cortical surface. And you see this pretty cool marbled pattern of differentiation. Uh, so I wouldn't call this a gradient per se, uh, although that's often used synonymously with eigenvectors in this field. Uh, so this we, we get a very nuanced cytoarchitectural differentiation because we're working at a pretty high resolution here at 100 microns relative to um, a lot of work I've done before, for example, within vivo imaging. And this eigenvector explains about 42% of variance. Um, just as a side note, the amount of variance explained is the most sensitive um, to parameter variation. The, we find that the gradient, the sorry, the eigenvector looks very similar if we change, for example, thresholding or a few different um, parameters of the diffusion map embedding, but it changes how much variance is explained by that eigenvector. So let's look a little bit closer at what this eigenvector is representing. So it captures changes in intracortical stain intensity profiles, these profiles on the left, and that's why I've also colored them by the same thing as the eigenvector. So areas with low E1 values, which are these blue ones, you see they have more of a peakedness of the profile. This we would think is around um, layer four as well. So they have this higher um, density of cells around layer four, but also in um, across the board. So they seem to have a bit of a mean increase in stain intensity. And then as you move uh, to the higher end of E1, you see the profile really flattens out. And you uh, have the, um, this represented across the subregion. So I wanna delve into that a little bit more because I think it's quite interesting that the patterns of different subregions vary. So each subregion, we can look at the distribution of E1 values. And you see that in all the subregions, so parahippocampus, um, inferior parietal lobule, medial um, middle temporal gyrus, inferior frontal gyrus, precuneus PC, like posterior cingulate type area, and prefrontal cortex is all lumped together as well. So these are the six areas of the default mode we have here. And all of them have the full range of E1 almost. So all representing a high level of cytoarchitectural diversity it captured by this eigenvector. 
but the spatial pattern of E1 differs between the subregions. So on one hand, we could look at the parahippocampal region and E1 values um, are relatively smooth. So you do see this little cytoarchitectural gradient there, which fits well with what we've seen elsewhere um, of the mesial temporal lobe as well. But on the other hand, if you look at the um, superior frontal gyrus, you see this um, very quick changes between extremes of E1 values. So it reflects this interdigitation of different cytoarchitectural profiles um, throughout the superior frontal gyrus. And then we see intermediary forms elsewhere. Um, so maybe it's a little bit too small, but for example, when you're moving away from the anterior cingulate, you see a slight gradient, but it has striations in it actually. And then as you move really far away, you start to get the interdigitation. So it seems to be a bit of a change in the, um, in the patterning or the frequency of um, spatial variation between the extremes of this eigenvector. And then we wanted to try to quantify this as well. So it's all very qualitative at the moment. And we stumbled upon this very cool niche of literature from landscape ecology. And that then led us to the concept of roughness, parameterization and material physics. So these parameters are they're relatively simple calculations to measure the differences in the amplitude and patterning of a textured surface. And in landscape ecology, they'd use this to yeah, characterize a landscape. So I thought we could apply it to our cortical landscape here. So here we have um, spatial coordinates, and then we're using E1 to say the topography of this landscape. And we um, deployed this whole range of roughness parameters. And then we wanted to see which of these roughness parameters best explains the differentiation of the different subregions. So we looked at the um, coefficient of variation of these roughness parameters. And the one that we found varied uh, the most was this, um, the amount of times it intersected the, N0, the E1 equals zero plane. So in the parahippocampus, because it's a gradient, it really just dives through um, in one fell swoop through that um, plane. But if you're in the um, superior frontal gyrus, it's gonna be going in and out through that plane. So that's why you have a lot more um, intersections of the E1 equals zero plane. And we also can normalize this for the, um, or standardize it by the size of the region. And we find this pattern once again. So there's a very clear differentiation of the subregions in terms of their spatial expression of cytoarchitectural differentiation, even if they all seem to encompass this full range of cytoarchitecture. So we could hypothesize based on, for example, the work of um, Goldman Brakic on the interdigitation um, in the prefrontal cortex that we know exists in terms of its connectivity. So she uh, theorized that this interdigitation is beneficial to integrate distinct forms of information. So you can see that the connectivity of this superior frontal gyrus might be very different to the parahippocampal gyrus, and that's related to how it's integrating different types of information possibly. Okay, so then next we can also use our Atlas overlap approach on all the different networks. And we find that all networks encompass multiple cortical types, but with different um, distributions. So it's not just the default mode that has um, a cytoarchitectural heterogeneity, but it does seem to have the highest level of heterogeneity. So here we use big brain again, and we looked at the similarity of staining intensity profiles within each network. And if we compare this to a null model where our null model is, is um, modeling a pretty homogeneous um, uh, cytoarchitecture of the network, we find that the default mode is the most heterogene heterogeneous, uh, closely followed by ventral attention network and the limbic network as well. So overall, we do find that the default mode seems to be highly heterogeneous, but I'm also keeping in mind that it's, it's a pretty huge network. So we wanted to keep building up this neuroanatomical characterization of the default mode in terms of its intrinsic architecture and also the regional differences in its extrinsic connectivity. Uh, we already know that the default mode occupies a unique position on the cortical mantle from Margulis et al. Uh, so we want to ask how this topography influences the regional differences in connectivity of the default mode to the rest of the brain. Uh, to do so, we combine diffusion-based tractography with distance to calculate the navigation efficiency between 400 parcels. So not only does the navigation efficiency elegantly fuse the distance and tractography, but there's also research um, showing from um, 
uh, Zaleski's group actually, that there's, uh, it really closely approximates invasive track tracing connectomes in non-human primates. So I think it's quite well suited to map low cost wiring in the brain. So returning to our question that I posed originally, of does the communication of the default mode balance external and internal sources? We looked at navigation efficiency of the default mode to different cortical types. So we're using these types as a bit of a proxy for um, proximity to external world versus internal milieu. So here I'm showing the median navigation efficiency of each parcel to each type. And we've stratified the parcels by network. So one of the bars here captures the range of navigation efficiency of parcels in that network to a time. So in some networks, there's obvious favoritism. Uh, so you see limbic network has really strong um, navigation efficiency to discranular type. But the default mode exhibits this um, very balanced level of navigation efficiency across the different types. And this is only extrinsic connectivity. So it's, it's not counting the um, types that are already encompassed within the default mode. It's only the connectivity outside of the default mode. And we also compared this to a null model that um, with a balanced level of navigation efficiency and only the default mode was more balanced than would be expected by a null model. So it seems the default mode has this potential to equally communicate um, efficiently across the sensory fugal hierarchy. We also tested whether this cytoarchitectural axis contributes to this balance. So average navigation efficiency decreases along E1. So those more peaked profiles um, of the default mode have higher navigation efficiency across the board. Uh, but this effect was actually more driven by uh, navigation efficiency to more granular types. So a lower E1 values have especially heightened navigation efficiency to more externally focused areas. And in, Evans, in essence, we're also finding that connectivity of the default mode is organized along this side architectural axis. So the structural scaffold of the default mode demonstrates the potential for an equipoise communication across the sensory fuel hierarchy. But understanding how this potential is actualized requires examination of ongoing fluctuations in brain activity. Uh, to do so, we modeled the effective connectivity using resting state fMRI and regression dynamic causal modeling. So RDCM is a highly scalable generative model of effective connectivity developed by our collaborator, Stefan Frassel, and that lets us inspect directed signal flow in the whole brain. So first we looked at this type effect. We find that a balance is present in the efferent connectivity, but not so in the afferent connectivity that shows some favoritism to other heteromodal eulaminate one type um, areas. Uh, so the DMN seems to broadcast widely across the sensory fugal hierarchy. Then we look at the axis, the cytoarchitectural axis effects. We don't see much of an association for efferent connectivity, but we do for the afferent connectivity. So this negative um, afferent connectivity mirrors what we saw in the navigation efficiency, showing that high E1 values um, are more insulated from incoming information. So those um, DMN areas with a more flat profile seems to be more insulated. But Unlike the navigation efficiency, we don't observe a type by axis interaction. So combining the, um, that's the navigation efficiency again. So you see there's a bit of a difference sometimes between the functional and the structural um, representations. But if we combine this together, we would hypothesize that the low E1 aspect of the default mode receives the majority of the input, but more granular types might have higher fidelity information or faster communication. That's why they have this preference for the navigation efficiency, but not so for the functional model. So our description of the default mode's neuronal architecture may help to begin formulating a theory on what information enters the default mode and what the default mode does with that information. So input to the default mode is organized alongside our architectural axis in such a way that there's preferential input to the lower aspect of E1. Ideas may be convergence points for information across the sensory fugal hierarchy. And these convergence points could allow for a unique recombination of information that lights a fire in the default mode. And that leaves the higher aspects of E1 relatively insulated from input 
And then once information gets into the default mode, we know there's really dense um, connectivity. And we've also shown there's a high level of cytoarchitectural heterogeneity. So that shows that information is constantly being transformed, it's changing dimensionality, and it's reconstructed. And the default mode reconstructs information in a distinctive manner that might not be enabled by the classic sensory fugal processing stream. And finally, we find that a default mode widely broadcasts this information across the sensory fugal hierarchy, speaking as to its potential to shape our predictions at many levels. Okay, so with that, um, if there's any questions on that project, I can pause for a second. Um, otherwise, I'll, I'll jump back to our map and then I might have time to run through one more project. That sounds okay. Okay, so I think the, the next most voted was the Manifold Volcano. So let's have a quick run through this. Uh, this was published in PLOS Biology um, last year. Uh, so feel free to check out the manuscript if you have any extra um, detailed questions too. Okay, so we started with this question of how can information be transferred from um, one cortical region to another? Uh, Susan Brattenberg succinctly responded to this by pointing out that there's three wiring systems in the brain. So A represents the intracortical horizontal fibers. These are by far the most prevalent. These are just the really short ones in the cortex. Then there's the U-fiber system, which um, ducks below the cortex, but just briefly. And then there's the long um, uh, association fibers, the, these big white matter tracts, which are not nearly as prevalent as these other two types. And there's been a few efforts previously to reconcile these different systems into a single cortical wiring scheme in the living human brain. And no single metric derived from MRI can really capture these features alone, although I think there's some pretty promising work now on um, capturing these with diffusion tractography as well, but uh, it's still a little bit hard to reconcile them all just with one imaging modality, I think. So we sought to establish the relationships between three different proxy measures for these. So we calculated geodesic distance in a manner that propagates through gray and white matter voxels. So capturing these components A and B. Uh, and then we also use um, correlation between the microstructure profiles. So as I described before, what, what we were doing with big brain is we take the stain intensity profiles and correlate them. We can do the same with in vivo imaging using microstructure sensitive um, MRI, and we previously validated um, that translation as well. So we're just um, correlating these profiles, see how similar is the microstructure. And based on the structural model that was formalized by Helen Barbas, um, based on non-human primates, we know that microstructurally similar areas are more likely to share projections as well. So this might help um, boost the sensitivity to projections that we're not capturing with other methods. And finally, we use tried and tested um, a tractography derived from diffusion weighted imaging. So we mapped the wiring features between 200 brain regions. Um, I often refer them as just nodes of this system. And it was interesting to note that the edgewise correlations between the different modalities um, were relatively low overall. So this is each pairwise correlation. So it shows that these wiring features capture unique aspects of cortical cortical connectivity. Then to integrate the wiring features, we first rank normalize them, taking into account the varied sparsity. So each matrix would contain the same distribution of values. And then we estimated the cosine similarity of each. Uh, so this brings them all into one affinity matrix. And this gives us very high dimensional and dense interpretation of cortical wiring. We chose to decompose this matrix using diffusion map embedding. And this was really to help reduce the noisy edges and just to focus in hopefully on some dominant processing streams. The first two eigenvectors accounted for approximately 60% of variance in the affinity matrix. So these represent this sensory fugal axis that I've discussed um, a little bit already. So running from sensory areas into more limbic areas and then an anterior posterior axis. This anterior posterior one I think is quite nice because it combines uh, local gradients and functional topography. So the ventral visual stream is captured within this as well as this uh, rostrocortal gradient in the prefrontal cortex. And then the sensory fugal axis seems to be this overarching organizational principle that unites local processing streams. We can also view the emergence as a two-dimensional space. Uh, so I'll refer to this sometimes as the structural manifold. 
Uh, the relative positioning of nodes in this space informs upon their propensity for a shared projection. So we can start to interpret this from a global perspective by coloring the nodes according to their proximity to axis limits. So we have greenness over to the left, blueness over to the right and redness to the top. And we project this back onto the cortex so we can see which areas are more similar to each other. As, yeah, and then we can, you understand the translation hopefully here. So we have these um, eigenvectors that are the X and Y axis, and then we're just projecting the color scheme onto the cortex, but it's just for visualization purposes really. So we assess the power of this cortical wiring space to predict functional connectivity using machine learning. Uh, we trained a boosting regression model in 100 individuals, then evaluated prediction in a separate cohort of 100. This was all human connectome project um, data, I should say, and then we validated it as well in the mixed data set, which was um, created in the MNI in um, Boris Bernhardt's lab. So at a region or region level, the wiring space could predict functional connectivity with approximately one standard deviation of error. Uh, the average mean squared error across all the regions was even less than 0.5. So this was really outperforming a wide range of other models that we tested. So here's the, the wiring space, the structural manifold. And then these were just using either one modality or fewer combinations or just using linear models of um, versus machine learning models. And so overall we'll find this wiring space um, provided quite good predictions. And the one below it you see is if we increase the number of dimensions. So we were just using the two dimensions of the structural manifold, but even if we increase the dimensions, we weren't seeing a big boost in the prediction of um, functional connectivity. And we also noted that the level of accuracy varied somewhat systematically across the functional networks though. So as with most studies trying to predict function from structure, we find that the prediction is best in more sensory areas, and we have more challenges predicting this functional connectivity in limbic, frontoparietal, and default mode areas. So there's always uh, room for improvement. Then we wanted to explore the broader cellular composition and relate variations in microcircuitry across the structural manifold. For this, we combined recently published cell type specific gene lists in RNA-seq data. Uh, the RNA-seq probes were acquired in 12 human adult brains and were located in 11 different cortical areas. And these were selected by the consortium to cover a broad range of cortical types. And because of this, they were really nicely spread out throughout the manifold. So maybe you can see the pink ones like are easy to spot here, but they give us a, a lot of coverage over this structural manifold, even though it's only 11 points. But we chose this because we really wanted to use this RNA-seq data so it would be well matched to the cell type specific gene list, which were based on RNA-seq as well. So we calculated the average of log2 normalized gene expression for eight different cell types and projected the gene expression back onto the structural manifolds. So high values are brighter colors. Now, if we just use um, multiple linear regression models, so you just use each of the axes to try to predict the um, the expression of each of these cell types. We found that the first two eigenvectors explain a significant portion of the variance in gene expression of many of these cell types. So suggesting that the cellular composition of the cortex systematically varies across the structural manifold, but obviously it'd be optimal if we had um, a broader um, representation across the whole structural manifold and not only 11 regions, but gave us a, a good um, insight into the fact that the cell types might really vary across this structural manifold. So then we wanted to use the structural manifold to maybe generate some hypotheses on the distribution of cell types across the brain. So to do this, we can naturally see that each region has a value on the first and second eigenvectors. But we can also superimpose new non-cardinal axes onto this space. So take here this diagonal, which runs from visual to prefrontal regions. So visual areas are here, prefrontal regions are here. And so we can say for this node what it is on X and Y. We know this already. These are just um, kind of fake um, simulation values. And then we can also figure out what its value is on this axis. We can do this for all these different nodes. And then we can go a bit wild and put in all these axes just by spinning it around. 
then what we can try to do is find which of these axes is most strongly correlated with the um, expression of a certain cell type. So for example, this green line is astrocytes. We see it um, has a strongest correlation with this point here, which is just off the E1 axis. So it might be around here, we'll see in a second, but it really drops off and it's not at all correlated if you uh, try to take this E2 axis. So we're trying to understand in, in which direction across the structural manifold do, does the cell type specific gene expression vary. So here we found that the four cell types were strongly and significantly related to one of these axes. So specifically, astrocytes increase from somatomotor to temporal regions, whereas microglia and OPC, so oligodendrite pre precursor cells, increase from occipital to prefrontal areas. And then we have endothelial um, cells increase from um, prefrontal to occipital. So we're hoping that this could help us generate hypotheses on the distribution of cell types. And also suggests a novel picture of the hierarchical organization of non-neuronal cells. So these neuromodulatory glia, such as astrocytes and microglia, seem to be more expressed on this right transmodal side of the structural manifold. So also, what I found interesting is that the intersection of these cell type gradients could produce this multi-form differentiation of the cortical wiring scheme. Okay, so next we aim to track the dynamic flow of information through the cortex using a direct measure of neural function. We're really lucky to work with some brilliant neurologists at the MNI. And so we're on a joint project on epilepsy that gives us access to intracranial EEG and the Mika lab where I was doing my postdoc, we were acquiring multimodal MRI in these epilepsy patients as well. And a subset of those also had depth electrodes implanted in order to guide surgical decision-making. So each patient, uh, there's 10 patients um, in total represented here. So they had approximately 10 probes implanted each and each probe had about 15 channels. And we were just selecting the ones that were in the neocortex though. Then using surface reconstructions and tissue specific masks, which we generate with an MP2 rate sequence, uh, we can then map these to the cortical surface. So we take the geodesic distance from the probe to the nearest mid-surface vertex. And then we could assign each of these electrodes to a parcel and project it onto the cortical surface and the structural manifold. And then we also decided to um, cluster the structural manifold because we don't have a, a full coverage of the cortex within each subject. It was more necessary that um, to just group these into sections of the manifold because we want to understand the large scale organization. Um, so we just assigned um, just a k-means clustering essentially of the structural manifold here. Okay, so then using the same type of model uh, for functional um, connectivity, we found that there was a very high prediction of um, this time uh, coherence between regions in this manifold. Um, but what we then moved on to was using um, this phase slope index, which can give us a measure of the directed uh, flow of information as well. So this, uh, the phase slope index has the same conceptual grounding as Granger causality. Uh, so in that the cause must precede an effect. Uh, if the speed of two ways is similar and has a time lag, then the phase difference increases with frequency. So that's how the phase slope index is then would be positive. And we can estimate this by looking at the slope of the phase of the cross vector taken within a specific frequency range. So we did this within frequency ranges of four Hertz um, as a sliding window. And so in practice, we can see that this technique accurately identifies the driver and the respondent in a simulation of unidirectional flux. And it's also um, doesn't uh, predict a relationship when there's just correlated noise, which in simulations was shown to um, outperform Granger causality. So this is our measure of um, directed flow of information using this intracranial EEG. So then for each, of these clusters of this space, we could define the characteristic place, phase slope spectra between the regions. So this is related to the, there's a rhythmic synchronization of neuronal populations, which we think is fundamental communication between regions, but it's still hard to know what frequency is uh, related to 
which type of function, uh, which frequency is interesting to look at. So that's why we took this broad approach and looked at all the different frequencies. Uh, there have been previous results showing that high gamma oscillations, for example, support feed forward processing, whereas alpha supports feedback processing. But here you see that um, if we perform a PCA on these phase slope spectra, so each of the lines here is a cluster of the structural manifold. Um, and then we take this phase slope, av average phase slope spectra to all the different regions. So here you see in the red, because it has a high positive number, it's a driver at this frequency, whereas the blue ones are more likely a receiver at that frequency. And we see that this uh, is patterned across this structural manifold. So this top quarter, which is the more somatic motor areas, is a driver in this uh, about, I think it's 28 frequency and these are more of a receiver. You can see that it could be this flow of information across the space that we wanted to investigate a little bit more. We also uh, cross-correlated these component loadings with cell type specific gene expression to see if the patterns of um, directed information flow were reflective of differences in the cellular composition. So we used a lasso regression here, and we find that there's a correlation between the principal component loadings. This is trying to um, differentiate these different parts of structural manifold in terms of their type of synchronization, their like their oscillatory activity. And we find this is correlated with inhibitory neuron expression. So there seems to be this relationship between the cell type expression and the type of oscillations or the frequency of oscillations that a region prefers. And then we sought to further decompose these electrophysiological differences at an edge level. So we inspected these matrices of phase slope index at different frequency peaks. So we found these frequencies of interest based on where there was the strongest differentiation across regions in the principal component analysis. So there appeared to be distributed directed coherence in these frequencies. So uh, this was using a mixed effect linear model and then we're thresholded based on a p-value here. So we find that there was still um, strong coherence between regions at these different frequencies. And then we looked at the patterns of this and we found that they fitted into this hierarchical scheme. So we found that the topology of the thresholded coherence matrix subscribed to the rules laid out by Thelman and Vanessa for constructing hierarchies. So we switched out traces and um, laminar origin projections for coherence here. So Vanessa, Thelman and Vanessa had these set rules in terms of how they build a hierarchy, but they were doing track tracing. Here we're just swapping it out for coherence instead. So specifically, the clusters could be ordered into levels. So coherence flowing in one direction down these levels. So in this 28 hertz, we see the coherence flows from these um, more frontal areas through to more posterior areas, so in a more anterior posterior direction. Whereas here in this more higher gamma oscillations, we see a flow of information from limbic cortices to prefrontal areas. So it shows that cortical wiring scheme supports multiple frequency specific hierarchies. Okay, so this has been really useful for us to understand the um, relationship between different levels of cortical organization. We've shown that it can efficiently describe cortical wiring using this global centrifugal and local anterior posterior axes. There are distinct spatial gradients of cell types that underlie this structural manifold. Uh, we are also reaching more accurate individualized predictions of functional connectivity from structure. And uh, this cortical wiring scheme guides frequency specific hierarchies and that there's cell type specific gene expression contributes to hierarchical levels. So using this structural manifold, we could try to bridge between um, these different scales and understand their relationships, even if data is more scarce in some situations. Okay, so with that, I'll, I'll head to just a bit of a conclusion. So. Across all the projects I've been doing um, in the past few years, we're moving from a unidirectional to a more multi-dimensional multi cytoarchitectural model. So we had classic von Economo and Brodmann style maps. We're moving to this multi-dimensional model where we're superimposing multiple cytoarchitectural maps, and then we can explore this multi-dimensional space. So I think this retains um, from the classic models the ability to perform topographical orientation and cross species alignment, which I think is a benefit of using cytoarchitecture rather than function, for example, which is much harder to compare across species.
um, but it also adds structure and multiplicity. So the structure in terms of the ordering of um, the ordering and relationship between the parts and the multiplicity in terms of um, stacking these maps on top of each other. And in doing so, this improves our functional predictions because it can um, capture more fine-grained functional differentiation as well as the dynamics and the multiplicity of function. And we show that it uh, improves our reflection development. It's not a project that I showed today, but we do see that this um, cytoarchitectural axes reflect adolescent development, for example. And I think that more improvements are on the way by doing deeper characterization characterization of cytoarchitecture, which is what I'm really excited to do at the moment in Ulich. And we can do continued validation with respect to development, evolution, and function. And I think that we need to continue with translating this to in vivo imaging so we can relate to function, but also I think that's the benefit for looking at individual variation where we can do huge cohorts. And if we ever want to start using this in um, more clinical outcome, um, clinical research or you know, to clinical decision-making, but I think that also, fortunately, there's amazing work happening at the moment in terms of increasing the resolution of in vivo imaging. So cytoarchitecture sits at this really um, neat spot where we can measure it with postmortem, but we're also getting to the point where we can al almost measure it in vivo as well. So it gives us a nice link between the two worlds. And with that, I'll also um, make a little plug because as of about two days ago, I started a lab. Um, so the multi-scale neuroanatomy lab is just starting in INM1 in Ulich. Uh, so if you are an interested PhD postdoc collaborator or know anyone, feel free to um, shoot me an email and um, you could come work in Ulich. And then finally, I'd just uh, like to thank everyone who's involved. Uh, most of this work was done when I was a postdoc in the Mika Lab uh, with uh, my mentor, Boris Bernhardt. So a huge thank you to everyone at the Mika Lab who was wonderful my ears there, and to my um, new team with Catherine and Timo at INM1, and especially a couple of collaborators I want to point out, um, uh, Margie Garber, who was a student in Boris's lab who kickstarted the default mode project, as well as Stefan, who uh, is always my go-to for everything related to DCMs. And if you're interested in the code related to this or just integrating histology with MRI, then we've released a toolbox called Big Brain Warp that has a lot of tutorials and code um, on doing all these types of analyses. Um, of course, shall we open up for questions? <laughs>